I'll give a quick introduction about myself and uh, let's just move this slide on. There we go. All right. So a little bit about myself. The talk's not about me, so I, I've just put a few pictures up there so I can cover cover this quickly. Um, it just describes my my journey from uh, graduating to where I am now at Talus uh, and just gives you a bit of background to hopefully uh, explain why I have an interest in sustainable aviation and can talk about it. So I joined the Navy as a aircraft engineer and then I also got selected as air crew. I was a uh, mission commander which in the Navy we call an observer. Um, and so my official title then was a maintenance test observer, although not not observing in the traditional sense. But my role was really to do maintenance test on and development test on weapon systems. And so as we go through my career, I spent quite a bit of time on small ships, flew Sea Kings and Merlins. Um, I then did some engineering roles, designing the flight deck and the aviation systems on the uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales. I was chief engineer of a helicopter squadron. I ran a flight test unit. I went out to the States and I was an airworthiness officer for the F-35. And then I ran the developmental test unit for a sh short period of time where my main job was uh, planning the first class flight trials for the F-35. And then I was the Release to Service Authority, which is the agency responsible for authorizing all the Navy's aircraft to operate, uh, so to fly and to operate from ships. So that, that gave me a good cross section into integration with different uh, aircraft and ships. So leaving the Navy, I thought, well, what can I do that really keeps me on the cutting edge of fifth gen aviation technology as I was working with the F-35, where do you go from there? And really sustainable aviation was the, the way ahead because there's quite a lot of read across between sort of the complex integration uh, of systems between aircraft and ships and, and the sort of leading edge technologies of uh, sustainable aviation. So uh, I got into that and then it took me down many different paths. Uh, I'm a, on the advisory board of Faraday Aerospace, and I'm currently managing the air portfolio for Talis Training and Simulation. So that's me. And if you want to ask any questions on that aspect, um, we, we can cover that off at the end. So, so I figured uh, let's do something slightly more constructive and uh, get into sustainable aviation rather than the uh, destructive half of my uh, first half of my career. So moving on. Okay, this is what I'm going to talk about. It, 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 it's really casual, so please jump in and ask questions. I haven't got many slides. I've just got a slide on each, so we can we can j jump around as you see fit, and we can dive into any particular topics that you're interested in. So, first of all, introduction: Why is aviation in the spotlight? I mean, there's been a lot of talk at COP26 about aviation. What's the problem here? So. Fundamentally, two and a half percent of global CO2 emissions in 2018, that was before COVID hit, uh, come from aviation. But it's actually a little worse than that because that, that's just CO2. Uh, if you look at the uh, contrails and nitrogen oxide, so we call that the net radiative forcing effect, there's about three and a half percent of total global warming comes from aviation. And a lot of that, two thirds of that, is from non CO2 effects. So we shouldn't just be concentrating on CO2, but really remember the impact of, of other effects like contrails. And and that's been fairly steady because uh, aircraft have advanced year by year, getting more and more fuel efficient, and the uh, numbers of air people flying until recently have been increasing as well, which has meant it, it's actually been fairly steady for the, for the last few years. Um, a disproportionate amount of that impact, though, comes from long haul and very long haul flights. Something like less than 10 percent of all flights are really long haul and they contribute 50 percent of all of the CO2 emissions. So that's where we really need to be concentrating to, to get maximum uh, improvement. So we've got a few top topics here. We're gonna, I'm going to explain the context. Then we've got electrification. Sustainable aviation fuels, hydrogen, EV totals, and then we can just discuss uh, whenever we want. So I'm just going to go into the the sort of the context of the way I like to look at it, because 
there are many, many aviation experts out there all looking at sustainable aviation. And so I tried to take a, a broader view. I suppose that comes from being a, an aviator and an engineer in that I don't I don't get quite sucked down into the details. I like to take a, a view across the, the whole industry, but not just the aviation industry, the whole transition to a net zero, because it, it, it is a race and the rate of decarbonisation is important. We can't just promise we'll arrive at net zero in 2050 and do nothing until then. It, it really is about how quickly we can decarbonise on that route to prove we're making progress. And you can't just look at aviation uh, in, in isolation because if, you, if you're doing something in aviation that's actually making it worse somewhere else, then we're really not contributing uh, to that net zero equation at a planetary scale at all. And the transition is really about e efficient use of new renewable sources, not just changing to renewable sources. Globally, we waste about 70% of all our all our energy and in the transportation sector, it's about 80%. So really, that is that's the, the magic key to unlocking this is is actually efficiency, because if we can make things more efficient, then the amount we've got to transition to renewables at the end is far less and far more achievable. So what I like to focus on how we can use our limited resources and renewables are limited at the moment and, and prioritize them for maximum carbon removal. So all clear, any any questions on that? And we can we'll go on to the next slide. Right. So let's talk about electrification. So electrification, um, the reason I put this first is because if we're looking at efficiency, you cannot beat electrification. It's 70 to 80 percent efficient. So that means that right from a wind turbine all the way through the distribution network into your battery, out of your battery, into your motor again, uh, you're not going to lose much more than 30 percent of that power. And that's really hard to beat in any other system. And why is it so exciting? Well, it's a, a massive revolution in the way aircraft are designed. We've seen nothing like it since the age of the jet because it gives huge amounts of design freedom. You can put engines in all sorts of places you wouldn't normally put them. Um, you can reduce weight of engines and cables. And, um, you don't have so much fuel systems, of course, that we can come onto the, the batteries later, but it's it gives you much better performance in terms of high torque, instant power. They're reliable, although they're Use in aviation is not fully proven yet, but we know that motors in general are highly reliable. And I think th the best advantage of all is a very low operating cost. Oh, someone waiting in the lobby. So all in all, ele electricity gives us a massive amount of freedom to change the way aircraft look. And if you look on that slide there at the top, we've got the Aviation's Alice. Uh, they're looking to have a first flight in the next year or so. Then we've got the aircraft I'm associated with in the middle, which is Faraday's Biha. And at the bottom, we've got the Hart Aerospace, which is uh, being made over, over in Sweden. Now, all slightly different. The, the bottom two are 19 seaters aiming for that sector. And the Alice is, I think it's around six, six to nine seats on there. So, so what's the, what's the, disadvantages of battery of battery electric propulsion well the main one is weight um because the batteries weigh a lot they are very low power so in the average battery nowadays has 72 times uh, less energy than jet fuel per, per, per kilogram although that's increasing uh, every day as uh, automotive industry drives that technology forward um there's many of the disadvantages in that the weight stays constant. It doesn't burn off like fuel. So you've got to lug those batteries around with you for the whole flight. You've got to manage them thermally. Uh, so safety and reliability, you've got to package them in such a way that the batteries don't arc or that they don't overheat and cause a fire, which will then run away and cause a, a catastrophic loss of aircraft. You've got to charge them. Um, so you've got to look at how you're operating the aircraft or you've got to sw swap them out. 
And then also we don't have much data on how they uh, how they degrade with time in, a, in an aviation use because it's very different to the automotive use um, because aviation you're you're often going full throttle for a takeoff and then you're in, in, in the cruise and you might cycle that quickly if you're doing short hops or if you're an eVTOL. So uh, I equate that to being like a, like a Tesla where you might put it in ludicrous mode and put your foot to the floor uh, every 20 minutes. Uh, it's really going to going to ruin the battery. So we need to understand how that impacts battery life in aviation and we don't have much data on that at the moment. So the power available is very dependent on the, on the use case. Now, if we look at types of propulsion, the uh, the big difference between those aircraft on that slide is the middle one is hybrid uh, and the rest are pure ba battery. And if you're looking at pure battery, the technology at the moment, I think, can probably stretch to about 260 watt hours per kilogram, which is, is the best battery available on the market. And then if you if you take that as your assumption, then actually those aircraft are are possible and they do give a useful range. Nowhere near the range that they're claiming, but they do would give a useful couple of hundred kilometers range, I, I think, once they uh, once they get certified. Uh, and then, of course, they're relying on advances in battery technology to, to take them further. But there is there's a finite li limit on that and they are st still going to be very short range aircraft. And that in itself is not bad because the majority of flights are under in terms of number of flights are under 500 kilometers so they will they will fulfill a very useful segment but of course you've got to ma manage them you may need more aircraft in order to allow for charging times in, in, as you do turnarounds so the middle aircraft is a hybrid a serial hybrid system where you effectively have a small power plant call it a, a, a gas turbine like a gas turbine generator from a from a larger aircraft and then that can run at a very very efficient constant speed uh, and that and that can then charge the batteries and drive the motor and then you can kick in extra battery power when you need it for takeoff or for landing or for quiet taxiing uh, and that gives you the best of both worlds really because it's very efficient so it should cut fuel consumption down by 30 to 40 percent uh, and it allows you to use a, a, a battery electric motor very efficient um, so so that's, that's a good idea but again that's that's highly dependent on how you use it um, it's also dependent on the architecture of the air the aircraft and and the design so Cranfield Aerospace looked into hybrid electric propulsion on a, on I think it was on a, a, a Dash 8 uh, and they decided it wouldn't really bring any major benefits, but that's because they were looking at, I think they were looking at a parallel system where you have a, a traditional engine and an electric engine. And because you're carrying around all that extra weight, it didn't really save that much fuel. Whereas de Havilland are looking at it and they and they are using a serial system like, like Faraday's uh, and they've concluded differently. They've concluded it'll save 30% in, in fuel if they use pure electric motors on the wings. So I think that's really promising because you can then replace the fuel that you have got there with some form of sustainable fuel. And then you, you've got a really great aircraft that's not range limited by its battery and it, it's highly efficient. And most importantly, it's quiet as well. So you can operate in and out of very small uh, airfields without disturbing the local population too much. So that's a good little bit of a canter through electrification. Um, so we take a little break for my voice. Has anyone got any questions about that? I do. Um, how long do you think it'll be before we start seeing these aircraft in the sky and carrying passengers? Ah, well, so there there is some already flying in terms of electric. Air. There's only one electric aircraft in Europe, which is completely certified and flying. That's the Pipstrel Alpha Electro, and it's a very small lightweight two-seat trainer but it, it's been snapped up by quite a few flying schools uh, across the country and um, because it's incredibly cheap to operate you're talking 30 30 40 pounds an hour max so for all those budding pilots out there the it really knocks down that barrier to entry of a huge cost where you might have been paying anywhere between 150 to 200 pounds an hour um 
you know, plus the cost of your your instructor to le learn to fly. So, so, so that's great news. So, and that's actually that's actually been around for a, a, a couple of years and certified. And it's a it's a very simple plane. It's got a kind of a batch a car battery system in it but it well, has been certified by EASA so that's a really good first step and then there's there's lots uh, hot on its heels um, so Diamond have got a EDA40 that should be certified in two years in Europe and then in the States uh, by Aerospace are building a, uh, a two-seater again a couple of years before that is certified um, and then in, in the larger uh, aircraft it's hard to say. I think the certification process is going to take much, much longer than some of these companies are claiming. Um, you know, the uh, the top one, Alice, I think they they do have a first flight fairly soon. But again, that that's a, that's an experimental aircraft. The actual full certification process is going to take many years, I think, because especially as they're going to be the leader. So I don't I don't think you're going to be seeing. Uh, these kind of aircraft in the sky in the next couple of years, but within five years, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would think you may start seeing the uh, slightly larger aircraft c come in, certainly on doing sort of island hops and sh short routes like that. Yeah, really, really it depends on the certification. The, the te technology is there. It's just an extremely lengthy process uh, for, for both the regulator and the aircraft operator. Has anyone else got a question? Yeah, I've got a question. So obviously with new technologies, it starts out uh, as we see very new, very early adoption, and then it, it will move over time to retrofit and upgrading older aircraft. How far do you think we are off seeing, and it could be a long, long time, but say an A320 that's running on electric power or something like that retrofitted? Yeah, a lot. So, so there are quite a few aircraft already in the works for retrofit, but they're all small aircraft. So you've got, um, if you look up Harbor Air in, um, in, in I think they're operating in Alaska, um, they've got a uh, uh, Otter, which they've uh, sort of an Otter float plane, which they have, uh, maybe Otter or, or, or a Beaver, I'm not entirely, I can't remember, but it's a single engine float plane, which they've converted to uh, electric with Magnet X electric engine propulsion system uh, and, and that's flying at the moment and, and there's quite a lot of videos of, of those flying around and that's the perfect use case for it at the moment because they just do very short short hops across harbors and things um, so so that's so that's a really good example of a re retrofit program and, and that's a great first step because then they're just putting a new a new propulsion system into already certified airframe so the process is, is a lot easier um, uh, and in fact, the EDA40, again, it's a certified airframe. They're putting electric propulsion system in. So I think that they'll be the first ones to market, shortly followed by the the ones which are changing the airframe as well. And the thing is, you really, you for best efficiency, you really want to design the airframe around the, the, the battery and the motor because there's so many advantages of having a motor. But if you're just stuffing it into a traditional airframe, you're not really exploiting those and you're not, you, you won't get the, 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 the best efficiency. Um, so, so that's definitely the the next step. But as for larger aircraft, then yeah, I don't I don't think we'll see. In terms of pure battery, you'd need to get up to around a thousand watt hours per kilogram, sort of five times as good as the batteries are now, in order to start making those larger aircraft viable on pure battery. Uh, and that's going to be pretty challenging. So I, I don't I I don't see that. I think what the way I see it going is. Uh, hybrid propulsion systems for the smaller regional size airliners, you know, so up to it's like a hundred seat airliners, you know, definitely um, hybrid electric propulsion, pr probably um, starting off with like the smaller dash eight size and then and then slowly working up as uh, as the technology gets better. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't see a role for battery in in the real long haul sector. It's just too. It's just too heavy. Uh, you need to, the weight of batteries to carry. OK. Right, well, if there's no more questions, well, I'll tell you what, the next slide here is, is a sort of example of, um, this is what we call the Gartner hype cycle. 
Um, and this is a good one to look for. I started to imagine when you see all these crazy announcements for these weird planes that, 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 that keep popping up in our social media feeds. So if you look, if you look at the picture at the top left, if it's big enough on your screens, um, that is the original version of the Aviation's Alice. Um, and that was touted, that was in 2019, touted as a thousand kilometer range. So it, behind it's the sort of the, the hype cycle. So that was at the, the peak of inflated expectations. And then as, as they start to think about certification and the reality, then the plane uh, in July 2021 changed quite considerably into a much more conventional looking plane. So if you can see, well, you, it's cut off, but the the engines were, the motors were on the wingtips in the first one, and then a, a, and a one on the back as well. And it's a, like a tail dragger. And of course, that's that's a, not a great place to put an engine because uh, you know, if you get one engine failure, it, it'd be almost impossible to to control. Plus, the chances of you striking a, a prop as you're taking off or landing would be huge. So that was never a great idea, but it looked great for investors. Um, and then so you can see it morphing into a more traditional plane and then the range slowly coming down. Uh, it's down something just over 800 kilometers. And, and, I, and I think they'll probably be talking about 200 once they actually get this thing airborne with the first generation of, of bat batteries. And then they'll start working up the, the slope of enlightenment as bat battery technology gets better and the certification process kicks in. And at the end of it, we'll have a, 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 have a pretty decent plane. But if you look at a lot of designs, you, you can follow that graph and it, it's almost always always follows through. It's very, uh, very rare. Someone will come out with the original graphic design that ends up looking like the plane does it at the end. So that's just a little, little aside. Right. Let's talk about sustainable aviation fuel because I think this is the, this is the key for me. <clears throat> so, what are sustainable aviation fuels? So we call them drop-in fuels because you, you, they they are jet. A, it is jet A one fuel, so it's fully certified as as jet fuel. You can just mix it with jet fuel. You can stick it in the same tanks, um, and there's no extra infrastructure required. Now, two ways of uh, doing this: you can have e fuel or power to liquids, which is a uh, developing technology. Uh, I mean, at least at scale. I mean, it's it, it's been done, but not a huge scale and that's where you're you're sucking the co2 out of the air or you're using waste co2 from another industrial process and you're using huge amounts of electricity and effectively built building a, a a fuel out of that so it's very very inefficient um, but it does result in a fuel where, where you know exactly what what its carbon impact is and it's a very clean fuel but extremely extremely expensive um so if you're looking at how much electricity you've got to put in to make it you're probably going to lose 80 to 85 percent of that by the time you convert that into energy at, at the other end so a great idea but very very expensive uh and then the other side we've got biofuel now biofuel uses nature to do the heavy lifting so it using plants to suck the co2 out of the air and then using a plant biomass, lots of different feedstocks in order, or uh, or indeed oils or waste to make fuel. Now, for me, this is probably the most promising uh, aspect of sustainable aviation. But it it can be really bad and it can be really good. It really depends on on how green the feedstock is and the regulations surrounding it, because you you could take um, palm oil uh, which drives a lot of deforestation comes from suspect sources uh, it can be the net benefit can be extremely bad for the environment or equally you could take another feedstock which really is a true waste and doesn't impact land use and you're going to get a, a a a great fuel which it might not be perfect there is there's still some co2 impact but it's a huge huge amount better than uh, than fossil produced jet a1 and there's a huge variety of, of feedstocks uh, as well. So, uh, and it's a proven technology. Aircraft are flying on it, on it at the moment. The picture there is of Etihad's uh, Airways flight. They recently did a 
from Dubai to London uh, with 30% uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Virgin have done it. BA did it. On, they did a flight from London to Glasgow on, on uh, sustainable aviation fuel. So th- th- this is being made. Most of the uh, fuel at the moment is made from uh, waste fats and oils. So that's the easiest way to produce it. Uh, the next stage is to look at how we're producing it from, say, uh, waste cellulistic crops so the stalks of corn that, that, that are not used or waste forest residue uh, that, that those kind of things but again all of those need strong regulation to make sure they're managed correctly so on the next slide i've got like a variety to show you of feedstocks so i'm not going to go into this but this just gives you an idea of, of how many different things you can use to make biofuels if you if you can read those and then the red ones are uh, fairly bad for the environment um, and then the, the green are the good and then on the right hand side you can see the the, the percentage uh, greenhouse gas savings w- w- which varies quite a lot so um, sorry and the red on the left is um, how much feedstock potential that there is so it, whenever you see uh, sustainable aviation fuel that's great but always question where it's come from how how it was made because there can be a, a huge difference but i think that the potential for making all the fuel we need for aviation is huge because if we electrify all of the cars we shouldn't be competing with all the biodiesel uh, and then we'll have we'll have enough to make a significant impact to long haul aviation now any questions on sustainable fuels It can it can be a, a quite a controversial topic because um, there's are a lot of people completely very against biofuels, but um, just because it can be done badly uh, doesn't necessarily a reason not to do it. It's a reason to make it uh, make it better regulated and done more sustainably. I was actually going to yeah. ask if there are any like formal regulations in place to stop people using things like palm oil. Palm oil. Yeah, well there are, but the problem is it, there's no it's not done at a global level and I think it's really down to the consumer or the airlines um, to really understand where their feedstock's coming from and, and kind of pass that information on to the customer as well so they can really when well, you can make an informed choice about flying and knowing the the true impact of, of that fuel production because even for the uh, even for the, the sort of the high publicity flights they've done recently on sustainable aviation fuel, it was quite hard to to get to find out where that fuel came from and how it was made. Um, most of those were done on waste uh, oils from industrial food production, which is true waste. Um, but then as soon as you start putting a price on something it's it's no longer waste and then people might start making it in order just to just to use it to to, to burn um, and then for example if you use um, msw so it's municipal solid waste again that can be great but if actually it contains a bunch of plastics then you're just burning fossil derived carbon which was otherwise nicely locked up in plastic and going to stay that way so yeah, so you, you've really got to examine where that came from and, uh, and what they're going to do about it. So, but that doesn't mean to say it's bad. I, I think there's a huge amount of potential here. Matt, you got your hand up. Yeah, so <coughs> this um, area of power, I suppose, seems to focus on sustainability of source. But what impact does it have on on the environment compared to traditional um, fo- fossil fuel based oils? Um, so I'm not quite sure I understand the question there. Um, so so you, you mean you mean after it's burned? Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. So so what? So it, the fuel it produces is basically the same as the fuel from a, a fossil derived source, but because the um, the carbon was in in the immediate carbon cycle anyway. We're not adding any more carbon to to the environment over a a fairly short period of time. So uh, rather than you know, so we're not we're not unlocking that 
deep carbon from millions of years ago and put it into the atmosphere. We're just taking carbon from a plant that it sucked out of the air that year that the plant was then going to die and then put the carbon back into the uh, into the carbon cycle anyway. And we're probably speeding that up a bit by making it into fuel and burning it. But the, the net effect is, is is the same over time. So, so, so that's how you know how we, how how we look at it now. And again, and, again, and that varies depending on which feedstock you use as well. Because if you're using a something from a forest, like a a piece of tree, then of course that might not have been gone back into the environment for another hundred years. So, yeah, maybe you're, you're accelerating that that process a bit too much. But, but in in general, yeah, as long as we're not digging up those fossil derived carbon, then it, it equates to a, a net uh, zero effect. Although it's not perfect, you know, none of these solutions are, are perfect, but they're considerably better than burning fossil fuels. But, but that's a good, a good question, though, because it is, um, yeah, it's often misunderstood that. Okay, any more questions on uh, sustainable fuel? All right, so let's get on to um, my favorite and most controversial subject, which is hydrogen, which you probably can't escape someone at some point in your day telling you how great hydrogen is. In fact, um, I was in London at the weekend and there was even an advert on the side of a taxi saying hydrogen will save us. So um, obviously sponsored by a fossil fuel company. Um, but so let, let's just look at hydrogen here um, in, in, in the case of aviation. So the pictures there, I've got Airbus's zero E concept for a blended wing body airliner. And then I've got these uh, zero Avia's last uh, hydrogen fuel cell flight, which didn't end too, too well. Um, right. So hydrogen has some great advantages it's really light the lightest gas and when you burn it it emits only water so great and and that's that, that's often touted in the media in the press uh, as being a savior for our uh, addiction to fossil fuels well unfortunately they don't often go list the disadvantages of hydrogen which are numerous and uh yeah, but 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 they are all overcome overcomable with enough engineering. So it takes up lots and lots of volume. So four to five times the volume of jet fuel, even if you compress it right down to a few thousand bar. Um, you know, and the the more volume, of course, the more drag. So then you need more power, and then you start going off in, in that cycle. So the benefit of hydrogen decreases rapidly as uh, the aircraft size increases. And that's why you're looking at those blended wing body airliners from Airbus there, because it allows a lot more space for uh, storage. Um, two ways of using hydrogen in, a, in an aircraft. You can you can use it as a liquid and just burn it in a regular gas turbine with a small amount of mo modification. Now, it, to be a liquid, it needs to be down around minus 260 degrees C, which is uh, Approach absolute, it's approaching absolute zero. It's about as cold as you can get. And then you need to move, store it at that and move it around the aircraft at that temperature all the way to the engine. So that's extremely complicated. Um, also takes a lot of energy to keep it at those temperatures. The other way of using it is uh, as a hydrogen fuel cell where your fuel cell system and that needs batteries uh, as well. And you take generally a, a gas or a liquid hydrogen, uh, you put it into the, through the fuel cell and uh, that generates uh, electricity. It's basically reversing the way it, it was made in the first place. Now, liquid hydrogen, uh, the boiling point of hydrogen is only a few degrees above its, uh, its point where it becomes a liquid. So as soon as it absorbs any heat whatsoever, it, it boils off. So it starts to, you start to lose some of that mass. So you lose, you can lose up to 2% uh, in, in a bad case uh, e each day from, from boil off. So you have to manage that with thermal management systems. And then the other problem with just burning liquid hydrogen is, is contrails because it emits a huge amount of water vapor. And at certain altitudes, that water vapor will just coalesce straight into uh, droplets, which is 
really bad for radiative forcing and can warm the earth uh, as bad as co2 although it doesn't linger of course but as we discussed earlier that two-thirds of the climate impact of aviation is through things like contrails and through nitrous oxides as well which it still emits if you burn anything at high temperature so I mean, so so burning liquid hydrogen uh, in an airliner not a great idea i'm not sure there's many many companies still proposing that that as a sensible plan um <laughs> Uh, but there are many, many companies looking at hydrogen now in the sort of the smaller regional size uh, airliners, uh, including Zeravia in the UK, which are looking at converting a, uh, I think it's a Dash 8 into a hydrogen fuel cell aircraft. But let's look at the other problems with hydrogen uh, and on the supply side, really, because I'm, I'm pretty certain that even though hydrogen is ex extremely complicated to work with, that uh, you know, we've got thousands of fantastic aircraft engineers working on it and all those problems will be overcome now it'll be a certification nightmare but i think we'll get there so you know we can definitely build a hydrogen aircraft in fact one was built by russia in in, in the 70s um so it, ha it has been done but let's let's look at the supply so 99 percent of all hydrogen is a fossil fuel so in fact all of that needs to be replaced with some form of green hydrogen before we introduce any more use cases. Um, so hydrogen is mainly made by uh, steam methane reformation, which is uh, using natural gas, uh, produces a huge amount of uh, carbons. I think something like seven to nine kilograms of carbon for every kilogram of, sorry, carbon dioxide for every kilogram of hydrogen produced. And almost none of that has any carbon capture on it at, at any scale. And that's called gray hydrogen. Blue hydrogen is the same thing, but with some carbon capture plus on it, um, which again is pretty rare. Um, um, and black hydrogen is when they make use coal to, to make it. And 2% of the world's coal is used to make hydrogen in this way. So hydrogen is a massive fossil fuel problem. And that's the first thing to solve before we start burning it uh, in a fairly inefficient way uh, in, in, in aircraft. So for it to be uh, carbon, uh, carbon neutral, we need to use green hydrogen, which is made in an electrolyzer by electrolyzing water using huge amounts of uh, renewable power and al almost no hydrogen is made this way at the moment and there's lots of uh, green hydrogen projects uh, sort of in the in in the pipeline but even if even if every single one of those was was funded and built on time by 2035 we'd still only be about a quarter of the way to replacing all of the dirty fossil hydrogen we have so you know, if we can avoid adding in new use cases uh, for hydrogen, which could otherwise be done by some other form of power, then that's probably the, the, the best way to go. So let's look at another uh, slide here. So this is for ground transportation, but I think it illustrates, it illustrates the point here. If you put 50 kilowatt hours of renewable electricity in and then you make it into hydrogen, and then you put it in a car and you basically reverse the process, make it back into electricity to drive your car. You're only going to drive <clears throat> for 50 kilowatt hours put in, you're going to drive 100 kilometers. It, it, if you just put it into a battery and then drive, and, and then cut out the middleman, so don't make hydrogen and then and then reverse the process, you, you can drive twice as far. So, so whilst driving a hydrogen car is good for the environment, you're going to see it's not as good as it could be. You could have doubled your carbon savings um, by just cutting out the middle amount and sticking it in, 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 in a battery. Um, and that, of course, equates to cost as well, because the cost of hydrogen is going to be directly proportional to the cost of the resources used to make it. It can never be cheaper than the power cost to make it. So it's always going to be more expensive to drive a hydrogen car than an electric car, which is probably why no one's buying hydrogen cars as well. Um, and then if we just go on to the next slide, so if you equate that to air aircraft, so what we're saying here is, uh, why would you why would you fly on a hydrogen plane from London to New York 
um, when and you, if by doing that you'd save 220,000 kilograms of CO2 if you used green hydrogen. But actually, if you gave that hydrogen to the dirty ammonia fossil uh, ammonia plant down the road, and then you flew your plane on 50% biofuel, you could save 336 kilograms, thousand kilograms of CO2. So the point of this is prioritize the dirtiest fuel replacement first if there is a, a, an alternative and i and there are some use cases where there literally is is no alternative but in the case of aviation we, we've got uh, different things we can do so, and i think the final point on hygiene is is economics it, it's going to be expensive and no airline is going to buy a hydrogen plane that it, it's going to cost twice as much to operate as a, say, a, a hybrid electric or one on, one on sustainable aviation fuel, especially if it's limited in routes to very specific destinations where there's, there's hydrogen available at the end point. So and economic economics will drive this because the price per passenger mile is 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 what airlines run on, uh, regardless of what they say about sustainability. If the economics doesn't add up, it's just not going to happen. So it might be a little bit negative on hydrogen there, um, but yeah, I think the best use for hydrogen is actually supplementing sustainable aviation fuels because what you can you do with hydrogen is you can. Um, increase the yield of uh, biofuels where you're using crops uh, like cellulistic crops which don't have a great carbon yield you're going to add hydrogen in, in there and th that'll make them much much more effective any, any questions on hydrogen must have some question on hydrogen because it's so it's in the press so, so much these days what happened to the aircraft that came down was that because of the hydrogen? Um, I honestly not 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 sure. They, I mean, they had they had lots of power, but I don't know whether it was the uh, well, what part of the powertrain failed. To be honest with you, I haven't, haven't I don't know whether the full report is out yet. Yeah, um, but you know, as you, there wasn't many seats in that because the problem with hydrogen is that the tanks take up so much space that you probably lose. 20 to 30 percent of your seats so you, you're introducing a more expensive fuel with less seats so the cost per passenger is 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 driving up when you when of course you could replace that with a sustainable aviation fuel instead and use exactly the same plane and i think where hydrogen um, proponents are concentrating is on the smaller more regional airliners because it's it's probably not going to work for very long haul transatlantic but then the smaller more regional are going to start competing with the hybrid battery electric which is going to be an or you know an order of magnitude cheaper because they're going to use less fuel and it's just the cost of electricity so yeah so then you it's going to be really a really stark difference in operating costs matt put your hand up yeah so um what what are the differences in risk around using hydrogen as a fuel? So I think the, the the general public, if you said hydrogen and fuel, that the immediate thought is Hindenburg. Um, yeah. And I suppose that that that's a challenge I expect the industry to have to overcome, but you don't hear a great deal of it discussed. No, I I think I think it's hugely challenging. Um, and that's why I think the certification of hydrogen planes will take a very long time. And there's a lot of extremely ambitious announcements by companies saying they'll have their hydrogen planes flying in the next uh, sort of four years. And I just think that's very, very ambitious because the certification standards won't change. We'll still have to meet the same safety criteria. Uh, and if you think about uh, hydrogen at high compression, um, you're going to have to have extremely strong tanks uh, and this is where hydrogen actually even though it's really light actually starts to fall down because the gas might be light but the cost of the the equipment around it, the weight of the equipment around it like the tanks have, are actually extremely extremely heavy so there's a lot of research into new new types of lightweight tanks which are extremely strong because they've got to then withstand all the changes in pressure as you go up and down as well um, and then you've got to be able to distribute that hydrogen uh, uh, around at the same time so yeah, I think it's extremely challenging uh, and I think it can be done. I mean, yeah, I think the, the aviation in industry will achieve it, um, but 
it's not going to be easy. Um, and, and, a, and I think there's going to be a few bumps along the way, as you can see from, you know, from Zero Avia's first first experience. Um, yeah, so I think that the the pathway to a a commercial fully certified hydrogen plane is is going to be a very long one. And I guess that probably leads into my other question. It's one I was saving from the electrification thing, so I was scoffing lunch. But, um, but it, you talk about certification a lot, and it, it very much certification in terms of new design. Um, what what skill sets do you see within those that actually we need to transfer across to the maintenance as well? Um, and do you think that um, the, the way that the maintenance certifications will change? So, for instance, is a motor going to be a power plant or is it going to be a component is um hydrogen going to be treated as fuel or is it going to be treated as something different does that make sense yeah yeah no i think it's um yeah because you know especially you know with relevance to, to marshall and the, the you know the training of m maintainers uh, i think yeah the landscape's going to look hugely different and and it it's quite difficult to know which way the industry is going to go. I mean, if you'd asked me to make make a bet, a bet I would say focus your training training on uh, electrical systems, principally uh, high power, high voltage electrical systems, because you can't go wrong there. Because um, even hydrogen is going to use the same high power, high electric, uh, electrical systems. Um, but actually, managing a hydrogen as a fuel, yeah, that's a whole new skill set that we'll have to learn off the chemical in, in industry um, because it, it, it's 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 extremely leaky because it's such a small molecule that actually it leaks out of everything and it, it, chemical plants lose two to three percent of their hydrogen every day in, in, in a liquid form and obviously you can't really tolerate that on an aircraft and and if you do, then it has to be able to vent it off safely. So, and I'm just thinking of an aircraft sat on the deck in Dubai. You you can't have it sat overnight with a full tank of liquid hydrogen. It'll start start venting off. Um, so yeah, there's a whole yeah. And then how do you maintain all of the all of that pipe work to move that hydrogen uh, around the aircraft? And you know the tolerances for those joints and things are going to be so different. Um, and how they're constructed to using liquid fuel. So yeah, that's a whole new skill set, and and it, the question is, is it is it worth is it worth ramping up that skill set if if you don't know whether the hydrogen bet is going to pay off or not? And I would say yeah, it's a risky a risky choice. You know, I would I would focus my resources on uh, um, power systems management, high voltage power distribution, those kind of things, which every aircraft is gonna is is going to need in the future. I would say. Okay, any any other questions on hydrogen there? Nope, all good, right. What's next? Um, EVTOLs, I think. Right, so EVTOLs, another extremely popular topic to see in the press. So we're talking, I'm, I'm really going to talk about EVTOLs in the context of sustainability here, um, because for me, the they're not immediately solving a sustainability problem. Whilst they are in of themselves sustainable, as if providing you're charging them with uh, renewable electricity, they don't really solve any problems because they're taking people from point A to point B over fairly short distances, which would otherwise be done by a train or a car, which I would like to think by the time these come in a scale, they will both be electric. So it's really not going to move the dial on uh, CO2 emissions for uh, aviation. Plus, if we if we look at where we need to have a maximum impact, it's in it's in long haul, short haul. It makes up such a small proportion of CO2 emissions. It's it's short haul aviation is unfairly victimised by the press in terms of its impact to uh, carbon. Um, in fact, you know, if you look at like the uh, announcements by France banning short haul flights and all, all these kind of things, and I think that's completely, completely un un unwarranted. Um, so EV tolls, but there are there are some very good things to come out of e e EV tolls because all of this, 
all this technology will uh, lead into the larger aircraft. And a lot of these companies have got plans in the works for larger and larger aircraft. For example, Vertical Aerospace have got plans for, for a, uh, a much bigger aircraft. So, so these technology leaders will be looking, developing the battery systems, the power systems, and all of those will flow through in, into regional aircraft. So I think it, it, it's a great thing, but there are uh, four to 500 different companies all making kind of crazy different uh, aircraft. And there's just a selection of them, of them down there. And really only a handful of those will, 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 will come to anything. And, and for me, the, the most useful will be those with some form of wing borne lift because uh, w when you're flying on a battery, if you've only got um, if you've only got vertical lift, then you're going to be extremely range l limited because the, the the power required, especially from some of these very small rotors, the efficiency in a rotor is all about the size of the rotor. So these aircraft with very small rotor diameters are going to be extremely inefficient and only do very small hops. So uh, those with some wing borne lift like vertical aerospace is going to be considerably more successful but again certification challenge is huge and i think it's going to be a few years before we're we're seeing any of these and they are not going to be a flying taxi they're going to be uh, uh done on very defined routes a bit like helicopters are now um for some time to come uh, any questions on ev tolls I was going to ask about how they're going to manage the airspace because I can imagine if there's loads of these little things flying around, how does air traffic control manage that? Yeah, and there's lo there's loads of programs looking at this. Um, uh, the US is probably m most advanced in, in, in its thoughts on this. So you really need some form of digital uh, air traffic management in order to control all these, especially uh, as their ambition is to become autonomous. Um, uh, in order to deconflict de itself from the rest of the air traffic. Now, I, I don't see these becoming autonomous for a very, very, very long time in indeed. And also, I don't see these operating in anywhere other than defined corridors, because uh, like, like helicopters now, um, there's always always a, a safety corridor. I mean, if you look at London helicopter routes, it's uh, in fact any city's helicopter routes. They're almost always uh, consigned to uh, uh, over the river for flowing through the, the centre of the city, uh, for a good reason. In that, if you you know if you have an engine failure, you have got somewhere to go that isn't isn't on top of a building, um, and it's going to be the, the same with most of these. Uh, I think. Um, it's going to be a long time before we see these landing on the tops of all all sorts of diff different skyscrapers from all sorts of di different directions. So I think we'll start with defined air corridors from point A to point B, and then as the confidence and reliability grows, then we'll slowly see these these expanding out into slightly more di distributed networks. Matt. You're on mute, dude. <laughs> oh yeah, school by error. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just wondering what the what consideration has been given to the offset and infrastructure. So you know, we no longer need something the size of Heathrow because actually we can do it from a, a pad, so to speak. Um, and and that must have inherent cost savings and and benefits to the environment. But I've I've never ever seen any of it particularly talked about. I mean, the heliport is in Coventry, I think it is. Um, yeah. But but you ne they never say by having this number of aircraft, whilst we have more aircraft, we actually save because X, Y, Z. Yeah, so I don't think it's going to make any difference to the bigger airports like Heathrow because they, they don't really take any of this sort of size of traffic anyway. Um, but I think it will... Uh, yeah, just it will it will help the kind of the, the case for regional aviation, which is is what I'm a big proponent of of uh, regional aviation and and growing that and that's and what would also cost is sub regional aviation. So for countries in the UK, I'm talking about uh, you know more uh, sort of 100 200 kilometer flights. Um, because there are so many airfields uh, around the UK that are just not used, and if we can 
avoid building houses on them, which has probably been the case for half of them. But before they're all built on, uh, we can start operating small battery electric, hybrid electric air aircraft like Faraday's out of these and then we can start taking people from a to b exactly where they want to go as opposed to sort of having to fly uh from newquay to london is the only way of getting out of cornwall but it's, it's nowhere near where you want to go so then you've got to jump in a car or, or a train after that so creating a, a, like a network of small a, a airfields uh it really opens up air traffic and that's when you're then going to start taking the load off the the, the major um, arteries like the, the the motorways and the trains and if you can do it with battery electric then it's going to be cheap so you can compete with the with the train so uh, some of these ev tolls will be able to compete so uh, larger 19 seaters like faraday's will be able to compete you can then start moving freight around because it'll be economical uh, and the key is it has to be quiet because there's no way anyone's going to let you land these things or operate your 19 seater out of their you know an airfield next to their back garden if it's going to make a noise all, all night long um and so we're fairly sure that the the the, the the, we can make the fixed wing quiet like like Faraday's but the jury's still out on some of these EV, EV tolls because the smaller your uh, rotor the higher faster it spins the the, the greater the noise um, and there's a there's a trial on at the moment with NASA actually doing some noise measurements so it'll be very interesting to see uh, how noisy these things are um, you know they're, they're fairly light so again the disc loading shouldn't be too great but yeah it'd be really interesting to see to see what the noise level's like because if they're if they fulfill their ambition of hundreds of these coming in and out in and out of heliports then they're really gonna have to be very quiet indeed okay any uh, any final questions as we we get near near the hour mark thanks for uh, thanks for bearing with me as i canter through this would there be a weight limit in terms of passengers and baggage on these things because i can imagine they're quite light so yeah oh de definitely yeah i mean they'll be extremely sensitive to weight um yeah they are that they will be and i think that they um you know that it's not gonna they won't be able to have a I think they'll just have to restrict their range so they can they can fit the uh, you know the the full anthrop anthropological range of people in, in this because I don't think they would publicity they wouldn't get away too well with saying you can only fly in it if you're a certain weight but uh, but yeah it will be extremely sensitive to to that so yeah I imagine um, yeah the baggage will be extremely l limited because yeah for every kilogram you're putting on board that's that that's a kilometer you're not going to fly. Um, yeah and and again it just depends how fast the battery te technology evolves really um and, and uh, you know until they start flying these things uh, frequently we're not really going to understand uh, the, the, those kind of calculations but yeah i'm pretty sure they can do fairly short hops you know heathrow to center of london should definitely be feasible when they when they come into service i, I would say yeah Okay, any more questions on anything at all? I think that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it was really interesting. Really enjoyed that. All right, great. Well, you know, if anyone has any questions, just, uh, you know, please, please get in touch with me afterwards. More than happy to uh, f follow up on any anything you might have. Um, I've got quite a few uh articles covering this kind of information on my LinkedIn page if anyone wants to read in a bit deeper. Oh, I will absolutely do that. Um, Simon, I think you've got a question. No, I thought it's a uh, lot of guys. So I think it's really interesting. I think as well, it um, serves to dispel some of the myths around, like you say, certainly some of the fuels, particularly hydrogen. You hear, like you say, you hear so many things about how great things are and you don't really kind of fully understand whether or not they are. And it's quite clear from what you've said that um, you see it very much electrification as being kind of the way forward, which um, you kind of hope then that everything's kind of on the right track and they're not going to waste too much time mucking yeah. messing about with things that aren't going to work. Yeah, that's a, my frustration is that the high, yeah, there's, a, there's millions, if not billions of pounds worth of investment going into hydrogen 
but in, in my view, uh, smaller, you know, very small aircraft like the EVTOLs, pure electric, uh, small regionals, electric hybrid, uh, and then less hybrid as batteries get better and better. But the, uh, and then for the long haul aviation, it's just some form of drop in fuel, which ideally will be uh, biofuels. Uh, and then when you if you run out of biofuel capacity, it'll be a e-fuel, e e which you probably need some form of carbon taxes in order to make it make it competitive with um, jet jet fuel. So so that, that's the way I see it. And actually, I, mean, I think a lot of the big OEMs and the airlines see it that way as well, because they're not invest. If you actually look carefully, they're not investing that much of their own money in hydrogen development. They, they're happy to spend the government's money, though. Um, because because it's really the fossil fuel industry's last stand is is to sell um, what they're saying is bl blue hydrogen. Other you know otherwise they're, they're going to be completely out of business. So they're selling it as a as a replacement fuel, but it doesn't really have a place. No, I think um, one thing I was thinking, and the guys are probably thinking the same. Um, we've well, there's obviously a lot of apprentices um, that would benefit from hearing some of this stuff as well. Um, so it might be worth, might be something that Janine, uh, we talk about a slightly different day, but I think it's massively interesting. And um, yeah, I really, really enjoy, I mean, I unfortunately I had a phone call, but I really enjoyed what I, what I managed to hear. So yeah, th thanks very much. No, no, that's, that's great. Good, Simon, so we'll share it with the apprentices for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I mean, the, the, this is this is the technology that they're going to be working on, not, not what you've got sat in the hangar now, really, isn't it? So yeah it's absolutely key to to train the give them the skill set for, for for the future um yeah and they can really start to sh shape this industry all right great well th thank you very much i've enjoyed talking about it uh thanks for taking the time to uh to, to watch um and send me any other questions if you think of them afterwards yeah no thank you very much that was that was awesome yes uh, thank you have a good weekend everyone Yes, you too. Bye, sir. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.